and we're happy to have you with us today to discuss this very important topic with one of my most favorite people in the world, Alita Mechtel. Thank you for being with us. Absolutely. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, um, she's got just a little bit going on right now and graciously offered up her time to share her experience as she is dealing with an incident in her school real time right now. And when she called to tell me about it, I was trying to find a tactful way in the midst of everything she's doing to say, would you do a webinar with me when she said, I think this would serve other people well if we could share what was going on. So thank you so much for not making me ask that ridiculous <laughs> question and for being so gracious and um, thoughtful about other people. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, a couple of uh, announcements and reminders for you guys. As usual, uh, for everyone who is on this live interview will get an email training certificate tomorrow so look at that look for that in your email i will interview alita today so we have very few slides but we this recording will be available by tomorrow from our website um and also i would like to encourage you guys i know that you guys have a lot of questions perhaps some of you have already been through something similar in your school. Um, if you haven't, you want to make a plan for it, we are going to encourage you very strongly to make a plan for it. We believe that most people at some point will have something that they will deal with related to the virus in their school. So that's the intent of this. So please uh, go to your, as we speak, please go to your um, question bar uh, your taskbar at, at, at the top of the screen, you will see both a chat function, which Carrie Pergerson from our team will monitor while Alita and I chat. And also there's a Q&A box and we will leave time at the end to answer your questions the best we can. So um, a couple of hinge announcements coming up. This is part of our reimagine series. So we decided after we got past some of the initial what in the world do I do content that we tried to put out, we wanted to do something a little more progressive and positive. And so this is the fifth, I believe, installment weekly in our reimagine your childcare business series. So we want you guys, we know you're in a very scary time. We know you're in a time where you're navigating without all the information you would love to have, but we also want you to see this as the opportunity that it is to reinvent your company, reinvent yourself, reinvent your team. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about Alita here is she is the master, as far as I'm concerned, in team building and I don't know anyone that does it better than her. So I will ask her a lot of questions about how she engages her team and what she's dealing with. Next week, um, I will talk about growth and in a uh, uh, downturn like we're in right now. If you're interested in growing your company, I will also talk about changing buyer and seller habits and changing processes. Uh, that we expect, we're seeing already and expect to see over the next at least couple of months, probably a year or two. So that's coming up next Tuesday. We'll end our series at the end of June with a, a speaker I'm very excited about. We'll tell you more about that later. We have, a, we have a fun guest at the end. We launched two weeks ago our um, Fall Thrive event, which we typically hold in person, we have made the decision to move that from September as a live event to early August to get it to you sooner and safer before you start school for the fall. And that is everything financial about your school. It will be, you will get one-on-one -on -one coaching with one of our team members. You'll participate in our social event the night before and get a very nice gift basket from us that will get you ready for that and also ready for the live event on Friday. You'll be able to participate in group case studies and 
ask questions of our team as we present that. So we're excited about that. I know we're more than uh, half full there and we do expect that to sell out. This is our fourth year and it always does. So get your seat for that if you're interested. We'd love to have you. If you have questions, let us know. Um, look for weekly every Wednesday. Alita and I also participated in a joint venture with Child Care Information Magazine to produce a video series um, talking about what's going on across all segments of the industry. And every Wednesday, these are free, they're released, and Alita was on the one last week or a week before, I think? Yep, this week. Okay, and um, <clears throat> I will be on the one tomorrow. Kathy Petchel from our team and Molly Petchel from our team are also presenters. So, and, and just a fantastic group of people who shared what they see in the industry, what's going on in their companies and other companies. So take a look at that. They're 15 or 20 minutes long and just great information. Um, so we're happy to be a part of that. So let's jump into this content, my friend. Um, you've you've uh, had quite the week or 10 days and um, possibly there are others who have been through an experience or if they haven't, I know that they're thinking about it. So why don't we just start by, uh, why don't you, I, I feel like everyone in the world should know you and if they don't, they're missing a real treat. But why don't you just tell us about yourself and your companies because you have more than one and um, let's just start there. Absolutely. So I am Alita Mechtel, proud owner of Children of Tomorrow Learning Centers here in Minneapolis. I have four. I um, just celebrated in January my 20 years uh, at my first location. Um, I also have a substitute teacher placement company called Teachers for Tomorrow, and I have a sister company of that, uh, which is the operating system of my substitute teacher placement company, where I created a business in a box model that um, if people are interested in opening their own substitute teacher placement company that they can purchase my system and um, and run their own sub company so in their area um, it is not a franchise everybody always asks me if it's a franchise it is um, it is the how-to manual all um, all done for you marketing onboarding teacher training um, how to run a company a lot of the systems in there um, help and overlap in child care centers as well. So, yeah. It's one of the most creative business models that I've heard in many years and was, of course, and will continue to be incredibly um, popular with people who are figuring out the whole staff challenge and a great compliment to our early education business. So, um, I'll go ahead and ask because I may forget in the end if people want to connect with you, where, where should they do that? They can email me directly at alita, A-L-E-T-A, -E at childrenoftomorrow.com. Here we go. Okay. Uh, if you're interested in um, that or other um, information, just uh, feel free to email directly or you can certainly go through us. So, um, like I said, you've had quite the 10 days. Why don't you... <laughs> Tell us about what happened and where you are, and I know sure. there's a wealth of information there. Sure. So as like every other childcare uh, business in um, the United States, or everywhere, I guess, uh, we're all working on um, how to keep our business running. We are working on webinars every single day, I feel like, listening to them, learning, working with our teams. Uh, understanding the PPP, understanding the idol, getting grants, um, trying to create marketing programs for um, keeping the um, enrollment up. And so I thought I was going in such a great direction and we were working so hard on our um, marketing plan for our families and our marketing plan for the teachers. And we were almost back up to our uh, pre-COVID numbers. Uh, right June 1st, we at three of my locations, we would be right back pre-COVID numbers. So super excited until, um, you know, uh, we were celebrating our uh, marketing success and our communication with everyone. 
And about four hours after we were celebrating, uh, we received a phone call uh, at one of my locations that one of our teachers tested positive for COVID. Um, so we went into play because we had been um, learning from each other and other child care centers. Um, we have a group that we talk every week uh, nationwide and, you know, what do you do? What would you do if uh, we're at a point that we should all be looking at, um, not if it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen to you. Um, it may not happen now, but it may happen in the fall. Um, we, it, my team came together and we were kind of um, talking about, you know, what we need to do first, what letters that needed to go out. Um, the next morning we had a team meeting with the, with the teachers to let them know, hey, look, we have our first um, positive case. This is what we're going to do. We're going to operate strong. We're going to be smart. Um, we wanted you guys to know first, uh, really made sure that they understood what the confidentiality uh, of this was and that we were going to close that classroom uh, for two weeks. We got on calls with the health department right away. They have been absolutely amazing. Um, my regional director, Abby, has been handling everything um, from the parent letters to the communication with the health department, the communication with the staff, um, the families. Um, I wanna back up a little bit and let you know that this uh, center that I'm speaking about had a director go on maternity leave the, about a week or so before all of this started happening um, with COVID where the state was shutting down and everything. So the assistant director had stepped into her shoes um, and then the assistant director from another center actually had been training to assist um, in that center for about um, three to four weeks and um, getting to know those families and getting to know those staff. So we have an assistant director that's ready to face challenges that I, none of us have ever faced and another assistant director assisting that um, assistant director. So they had to um, act quickly and smart and they have learned a ton. <laughs> so thank goodness we, um, we had that team uh, in place before any of this happened. Um, so getting back to, um, it was a week ago Friday, Saturday we had our uh, lead teacher meeting then after that, we decided to call each one of our families um, personally that was in that room to let them know that we were going to close um, the classroom and that they had to quarantine for two weeks, everyone in their family. Um, we then, uh, Abby had written the letter to the whole entire school and we got that communication out, making sure that the whole school knew um, that we had COVID in the building. Um, Within four days, uh, we had multiple positive cases of um, teachers going to get tested, children going to get tested. We were getting calls letting us know that um, they were testing positive, the sibling was testing positive, the teachers that tested positive then were calling us, letting us know that everyone in their family was getting tested. It just felt a little bit um, out of our control and we could not keep up with um, the amount of positive cases. It felt like there was a lot more than I've ever seen. I, I don't think this will happen with everyone's case. I don't know if it's a different strain, but um, I just wanted to make sure that we were trying to be ahead of it and we never were able to do that. Um, Thursday, uh, just this last Thursday, uh, we worked really hard every day with the health department and the head of epidemiology and had meetings and decided as a center, we would close. And um, they did not, the health department didn't want us to close because they feared where all these children for essential workers were going to get care. Uh, so they really had to do some thinking and working through that. And then um, at the end of Thursday, they supported us. I mean, they supported us anyway, but they helped write the letters. They helped um, give us verbiage for our families. Um, 
I wanted my other child care centers then to start wearing masks. And some of the families didn't really want to see that quite yet, I don't think. And so um, to provide us communication and verbiage for those families of the importance of us wearing masks and, and that it's going to be the new normal in the child care centers. So um, it was fast and we had to act quickly and, um, and it came, you know, we always thought we're prepared, but this came faster than any of us had ever dreamed or would ever think that this, these positive cases would come, so. Right, um, I, I have to start with, you are the first person in the country that I have heard say, I see the point at which we will be 100% recovered. So I would first of all like to say congratulations for that. You, I know that you're, you remained open the entire time to serve essential families and more and more people felt comfortable with the situation, continued to come back, and parents have been incredibly supportive of this situation as well, right? Yes, yes, we've had, um, a, a lot of our families were calling to just keep us posted. Um, we did give our, um, Abby gave her cell number out and they have been calling. They will let us know about the neighbors. Um, they're letting us know about the siblings, anybody else. We encourage them to tell, you know, the neighbors and anyone else that they heard to call us and let us know about the cases. We were finding out about positive cases from the health department as well because they knew you know it was reported already from the doctor's offices so right um so at this point you've been closed a week uh we are one classroom was closed a week the whole center has only been closed friday and today we'll reopen the whole center hopefully fingers crossed june 1st okay so your intention is to open next week mm -hmm. We know others across the country who have had a teacher, a child, maybe two teachers. Um, so there are others who, and, and it, you know, statistically this would be true, what I'm about to say, they're usually people that have more than one school and statistically they're going to have a teacher or a child. And so others have dealt with the same um, situation. Um, so what protocols are you, what are you doing right now as far as the building is concerned to prepare for your reopen? Right, so um, a few weeks ago, well, a few months ago actually, I was um, already communicating to some people that I have built um, community relationships with um, a restoration company in case we ever needed to be um, fogging our schools for um, disinfecting. Um, just making sure our cleaning company was up and ready to go. And the one thing that um, we found out is I didn't think I was going to need this fogging <laughs> company. And I just kept pushing it off and pushing it off. And their prices kept lowering and lowering for me. Um, that's one thing I want to make sure everybody is aware of. There are so many scams right now that people are really um trying to make a lot of money on the cleaning and sanitizing and the fogging and i can make it so good for you um be careful who you're working with and make sure that you trust the people that you're communicating with um because you know what i found out is um not everybody has a product that will will clean and sanitize they say that they do but um make sure you have that lined up should you need this um we, uh, when we did close um, the classroom, that very first um, positive, we found out Friday and on Sunday, I had already had people in my building fogging uh, the, the schools. So they, they are, I had that communication going. When we put that communication out to our families and our staff that we were fogging, um, we had so many uh, husbands and dads at the center you know, come forward and say, hey, you know, what kind of product are you using? What are the specs? We work for a um, commercial cleaning company. And, and that's something we didn't know before. Um, so I highly recommend everybody out there to 
have a different level of communication with your families and really know what they're doing because you need to utilize them or maybe they have a neighbor or an aunt or an uncle or somebody that can help you. Um, make sure you've got your um, connection solid when, when during this time it's, it's, or any time. It's really important right now to make sure you've got those um, phone numbers and those connections right at the tip of your fingers. All right, I wanna talk about your plan in great detail in just a minute, but I failed to mention where your schools are. They're in Minneapolis Market in Minnesota. Um, also, someone was asking the question if it was your choice to close or the health department. The health department did not mandate for you to close. They wanted you to stay open, right? And you made that choice. Um, how many of the families who were there before do you, I know it's a little difficult because some of those may be dealing with illness in their um, families, but when you reopen next Monday, do you have a sense yet of how many families you expect? I don't um, because every time we receive a positive uh, result uh, for a test, that means a sibling and that child has to be out. Um, so we were at over 100 children the week prior, and um, we were at 24 children when we closed our doors on Thursday. Right. Um, how are you in your, so you have all along since March constantly evaluated and made a plan for um, how many families and children to expect the next week. How is your team doing that? So we, um, we have a marketing meeting every Friday. Uh, so we are making sure that we're communicating with every family that is not at the center currently. And we are just really getting to know how they're doing, what their family's up to, are they healthy? Um, letting them know what we're doing inside of our buildings as far as cleaning, sanitizing, um, keeping up to date with everything that, um, that the CDC is recommending. We're still um, not letting anyone in the building unless it's the teachers. You know, we're taking off the shoes at the front door. We are, we have a um, sanitation station at the front door. So when the parents drop off, we um, bring the children to the bathroom, wash their hands, um, we take their temperature. We're just making sure that the people that haven't watched this all go on understand all of the extra added steps that we're taking to, to be safe in our building and to make sure that um, these kiddos, when they enter uh, their classrooms, are getting uh, the most care that they can get um, for safety reasons. You know, where are we placing the cots? How many children are in the classrooms? it was getting uh, more difficult as enrollment was coming in to have smaller group sizes. So what does that look like? You know, some children are outside while some children are inside, some, you know, trying to keep um, as little movement within the center, you know, with the classrooms as possible, uh, making sure that the teachers that were in that classroom in the morning are still in there all day long. So they're not, you know, going back and forth to the classrooms. There's a lot of things that we're putting in place to be safe. It's just, um, this sickness is strong. It's got a strong, strong way about it. It just takes over. It does, it does. Um, so let's, let's go back to um, two months ago when all this started. It seems like a lifetime ago, right? Yes, right. Maybe it's been longer than two months, but it seems like forever when I said that. Um, as this got started, how did you think about and prep with your team? Were you, were you mindful? I mean, obviously everyone's thinking about it, but maybe in the capacity of, uh, I hope I don't have to deal with this. How did you and your team prepare initially? what did you have in place? How did you organize? Yeah, so um, for me, I am a strong believer in um, taking ownership in the schools. So all of my teams um, operate their center as it's their own. Um, I lead and then we meet each week and we discuss what's best for each center and what we should be putting into place for success. Um, for me, I wanted to make sure that um, I was healthy 
and I didn't want to walk into these schools uh, during this time because I needed to be the brain behind it. Um, my um, regional manager has been working from home this whole, most of the time she's been checking in um, and she is making sure that all the directors are doing what they need to be doing um, each week. But we do, we've, we've um, before COVID, we had weekly meetings um, for accountability and policies and procedures and what we would do if this happens. Um, so if you look at your chain of command and who um, is going to take care of things, what would happen if I got sick? You know, who would be the next one to take care of the centers and make sure that they were running? Of course, it's gonna be my regional manager. Well, what if she's not available? You know, who's next and who's next? And so um, we've always had that, but what I look back and what I didn't do is make sure I was setting those schools up. Um, should the head of that school, the quote unquote owner of that school, which is the director, um, what if she got sick? And what if the assistant director got sick? Because in all reality, um, you know, it happened. And who runs your school then? And who's the next in line? Well, you really have to think about that. Do they have children? If they had Corona in that classroom, and they had to quarantine, would your next person in line have to be quarantined for two weeks? And <laughs> if you pulled that person out, who would be next? And so a lot of us that are operating as owners and directors really need to think about that. Or all of us that are thinking, you know, oh, my, my director will take care of things when I'm sick. But what if your director gets sick? And um, so we had a meeting last week and we really made sure that we had our top all the way down to six people um, to make sure that we have, you know, this, um, they know the staff schedules for the next two weeks. They know all the emergency operations. They know what the login for the phone to check messages. Um, who do you call if there's deliveries, you know, making sure that you have a checklist ready for the upcoming two weeks all the time. Um, what do you do if your whole building closes? Who are all the people that you need to communicate with? Um, it's, it's, it's a sickness that makes you sleep a lot. A lot of people are getting headaches and they're very, very tired. So checking your emails and getting your phones are very limited. Um, it's not like other sickness where you can just be at home and kind of still work. Um, it's, it's different. So you really have to think of um, who will be able to lead your school and continue the success of that school should your top two, three, four are out quarantining. We, we um, you know, I'm so happy to hear you start with the fact that you considered how to protect yourself first, because if you don't, then everything else unravels, right? And we, we speak to owners all the time about in a successful company, you have to care for yourself first. And a lot of people, we're such a giving community and that feels selfish to people, but you can't possibly be here for the needs of teachers and families and children if you don't put yourself first. I'm speaking with many owners who have fragile health issues Perhaps they're in an age group that makes them more vulnerable. And those people have to be extra careful. Um, and then also, I like what you say about you went down six levels. So you kept asking the question, who next? Right. Six times until you had a plan and you knew what that person plan looked like. That's, that's, a, that's a great way to think about it. Um, can you talk to us about the elements of your plan? So now we know who are the people that will implement the plan. What, what parts of a plan did you then have to have? Was there a plan for cleaning and a plan for what yeah. were all the elements of the plan? Yep. So we just um, had to make sure that, I mean, every day is changing and I feel like our plan, <laughs> We just get it all ready and then we roll it out and two days later we're changing it again. So 
For us, it's just really making sure that we're up to date on all the health department news and what the CDC is saying. So, you know, the typical hand washing, um, temperature, um, being out, you know, how many hours after you're fever free. We actually took it a little bit further, Kathy. Um, we actually said uh, to our families, if anyone has a 99 degree fever or higher, um, we have to not allow them to come into the buildings. And thank goodness we did, because I would say about 75 to 80% of our children that are testing positive for COVID are having a 99 degree fever. And so if we were running regularly, I think it would be um, a little bit more our numbers that were positive. Um, we also said instead of 24 hours fever free, medicine free, we asked for 72 hours because they were still contagious. Um, some of these policies that we're putting into place is, you know, having on site shoes only um, instead of walking through the child care center with the with the shoes that, you know, were were outside and coming in and um, just all of our staff, we put into place our health and wellness checks. So um, we have somebody in charge of making sure that all of our staff every day before entering the building have taken uh, their temperatures. Um, have they traveled outside of the state? Do any of their um, family members or anyone that they live with have any symptoms? You know, we're logging all of that. Um, same with the same with the children that come into the building, making sure that all of our employees know that. This is now a new rule. We have to ask all these questions first and take their temperature, wash their hands, change their shoes before coming in. I'm also, um, what I've put into place is, is I'm also doing Facebook Lives on my private Facebook group with my um, teachers. I'm doing Zoom calls, I'm doing um, Q and A's. We're sending out letters every day. Um, to all the families, updating them, uh, basically how many cases we have, if they have any questions, um, you know, here's who you contact for, for this question and this question. And, um, you you know, find that that keeps the phone, does that keep the phone calls down to a minimum? Because I just have in my head right now, your people not even being able to operate for answering questions well, and yeah. providing emotional support. Yeah, so my biggest, when I communicate to my employees or my management team, um, I always make sure that they know that they need to communicate so often that there won't be many questions. We have to answer every question that could possibly come up in our delivery, so there's very little questions needed to be answered. Um, the emotional uh, support is, is what's needed right now. Um, my team, I was so proud of them on Monday morning after we had that positive case on Friday, Saturday morning we had an emergency um, you know, team meeting, and then Sunday night I had a company-wide employee meeting. So that one location was on two extra meetings in the weekend that they had to, and they walked in doing their job on Monday morning, so proud and following through. Nobody really had any questions. They weren't concerned. They knew we had their back. Um, it just, it, I was so proud of them walking into a situation where they could have been so scared that they didn't want to come to work, but they were su superb, superb. I have said to you before, and I, I say this to many people across the country, but you can't build a relationship in a crisis. And the fact, and the fact that families are calm and supported, the fact that your teams are showing up and they're executing is a testimony to your leadership and the team that you've built over a long period of time. Um, well, I see owners across the country calling on the investment they made in those relationships at this time and it is serving them really well. Um, there are a couple of questions about, and this is a good question, so there are a lot of states that are still operating under lower ratios and about three weeks ago we started to hear providers across the country bumping up against those ratios now. So for a while the one to ten, I'm sorry, 
10 group size, which um, depending on your age group um, was okay because they didn't have that many families to serve. But a couple of weeks ago, um, many people started to talk about, we can't serve the families that really need to go back to work. So um, it's a struggle. Sounds like your state was more flexible. Yes, and um, you know, we've been waiting for that to happen. And um, a lot of us said, well, a lot of uh, my team said, wouldn't you think that they would have already put that into place? Well, I look at how quickly this went through my center. Um, and I wonder now if they're gonna start seeing these patterns or I was just a fluke and we had so many cases because again, I'm seeing one here and one here. And I mean, I, I haven't seen anything else like this, but you know, are they gonna look at that and say, well, maybe we shouldn't be bringing on so many families at once. And um, I'm just crossing my fingers that that doesn't happen. But it also makes me think, you know, because I'm on the other side of this, um, I'm trying to ramp up my <laughs> enrollment and get back to my numbers and operate and make sure all my teachers have a place to go and, and my subs have childcare centers to work in. And um, is that really the safest route right now when, when I'm, you know, having my classrooms be where we were before and, with more enrollment comes more risk. And with more risk, trying to operate like that, really. I mean, I don't want them to, we had over half of our staff, well, seven of 14 members be positive and we, you don't have enough teachers to run. And then I look at, well, I, it's okay. I have plenty of subs. I have 41 substitutes that need a, need a spot to work, but do I really want to put my subs into a building that I won't go into. Right. And so, you know. Right, lots, lots of questions with you right now, of course, because you're right in the middle of this and we will appreciate your insights later. <laughs> um, I, I feel like with um, the contagious nature of it that um, maybe there would have been less cases, but it would have, you know, it would have spread beyond one person. Obviously, if you, if you had um, less people in the building, can you uh, describe a little bit about the protocols that you've been using? Because I think yours are some of the best. So um, I think the the first question people might have is why would it have infected more people than some others? But uh, you spoke a little bit about your protocols, but Talk a little bit more about the safety measures you've been operating under. Just again, um, you know, keeping in communication with my teams, um, making sure that they understood that they had to social distance as well inside the buildings. I think they forgot about that. And I had to continually remind them that we're still in close quarters and we still can't just be in a group picture and hug and when we're doing our YouTube videos, um, yeah. you know, making sure that you're not standing right next to each other. And I mean, the videos are great. I am so proud of my team all of a sudden becoming YouTubers. I mean, come on, when did we all preschool teachers <laughs> think that we were going to be on YouTube? But, um, you know, making sure that this is, they knew that this was serious, um, serious stuff. And and just keep reminding them weekly, um, pretty much every time I could had any information to share to get on and, um, and communicate with them. Um, making sure that our parents felt safe, I think was the other, other piece because, you know, watching Facebook and watching YouTube and, and sending out these videos to the families that are scared or have fear to come back because their child will be sick, you know, they want to have that picture of what's going on inside that school. Are you social distancing? Are you cleaning? Are you doing everything that makes me feel good as a parent to bring my child back? So everything is about um, following the rules and regulations for cleaning and sanitizing, um, being safe, but not taking away from the genuine care of the child. I, 
you know, I've, I've spoken on um, many webinars about, you know, these infants and toddlers and preschoolers need our touch and need our arms and they need our care. And it's really difficult when we're supposed to continue to be social distancing. I mean, and then to keep the camaraderie in the, that you used to have in the break room or the teams that were so close. So, you know, what we're trying to put into um, protocol is more letter writing to each other, more thank yous um, via, you know, um, Facebook or, or Zoom. Um, little gifts that we're providing our team to write letters and send off to the employees that aren't there, or the families that aren't there. Um, how are we making those connections and following all the protocols for safety and, you know, sanitizing and, and cleaning and, um, and I, I, I don't know, Kath, I mean, I think down to it, we're all going through this how we get through it, using each other's um, information, making sure that, you know, if, if one person goes through it, it may not be the same for the other, but if we have a, a whole bucket of ideas of ways that everybody is, is handling it, I think we can right. you know, adjust it to our own um, situation and our own story. Um, I think, one thing that you and I talked about, and the one thing that I did want to say, at, and I'm just going to say it at this time, but um, a few years back, I started uh, working with um, a book called Traction. And I have um, always run my company. I was a teacher, I was a director, I was the, I'm the owner, and I thought I could do everything. Um, I never knew how successful my company could be until I stepped out of my company. I never understood how much I could do by not being involved so much. Um, hiring the right people to be in the right places at the right times, doing what they do best to run your company is so important. And I never realized um, how important it was until I stepped out and then when your company goes through something like this. You know, you've got cracks, every company has cracks. Every company has things that are gonna fall through the loop. Somebody's gonna forget to do something. Um, having a team put in place that your cracks, or your cracks don't come become these gaping wounds, um, you know, we can fill everything in. Everybody's got something to give. And, um, and I just really want all of you to understand that you need to invest in people to do jobs for you so you can do your job as a business owner. And um, I couldn't be more proud of my management team right now. I, they tell me how they're solving these problems. They come to me and you know, I may argue with them, I may hold them accountable in ways that they've never had, and they may get really mad at me, but in the end, we all know that it's, you know, working together, what's best. I don't have all the answers. My regional may not have all the answers. You know, we, my directors might not have all the answers, but together, we have an amazing answer. And so, um, I, I will never, ever, ever look back and and go back to the way it was, uh, no matter what. You need that support, you need those brains, you need that power behind your company. And um, they are the ones that will help create that, those, those protocols. They are the ones that will ensure the follow through of the proper um, rules and regulations. Uh, your team that you create and entrust and you give that ownership to them, they will make sure that they, they hit uh, those objectives that you've set for them. I love that. I've learned so much from you over time about team building and um, you're the best I know, like I said, but um, I know that that's serving you really well right now. Yes. Um, and it, it's everyone's instinct, not just in a crisis time, that they grew their baby, their business, and, you know, they want to take, keep tight control over it, but with good intentions. Right. But to get anywhere and survive anything, um, you really have to let go. And um, 
bring your people in. So and that's like, not easy. That's no, not easy. No. I cried. I cried because nobody could do it the way I did it. But the more and more I gave up my what I thought I had to watch and what I had to control, um, the more successful my schools became. And um, in this, I could never have gotten through any of this without my teams. I, I can't even imagine what I would do as a business owner right now without my teams um, doing what they're doing. I, I can't be more grateful. I also appreciate you saying that everyone is navigating right now based on their own circumstance and without the information you wish you had. I mean, we typically make decisions based on history. That's a good indicator of how things will work. And there's no history for this whatsoever. <laughs> and there's no right answer. Um, everyone is having to take the information, apply it to themselves personally, their school, their state, their geography, their, their parent group, and just to do what's best for them. And it's such a difficult time. Um, we wish we had more information, but we have to take the best of what we hear and then uh, make that work for us. A uh, couple more questions, and we have some fantastic ones from our guests. Um, I just wonder at this point, and, and like we said, you're in the middle of it, and I will um, on my um, webinar next week, give a quick update from you, if you don't mind, on how you're doing, and then uh, maybe we'll um, convince her to come back if we treat her very nicely right now. Um, at this point, would anywhere along the way, would you have done anything different? I think that's a, I know you asked me to think about this and I've been thinking about it. I, I think that's a loaded question in a way that I'm not sure I would do anything different. Um, the one thing I would have added is making sure my chain of command went all the way down because we looked back and we really had to make sure that that communication was clear and in case something were to come in the other schools. Um, I think just really being transparent with the unknown, you, you don't know. And every single day um, changes. And the outcome is going to be different as the days come. And making, again, I, I'm grateful for my team because that gave me the opportunity to have the deeper conversations or the the communication with my staff and the families and, you know, doing all the, the fun games online and the scavenger hunts with the families and the children and, you know, the bingo games and, you know, trivia nights that, that I get to do and my team gets to do the paperwork um, and the, the managing of the schools. Doing something different. Um, I don't know, Kath, I, I've been thinking on this <laughs> I don't know if there's a different because every day is different and um, you do the best you can with the information given to you and um, making sure that everybody's safe in this environment. So um, we've learned a lot. We've written a lot of letters. We've got communication like crazy. We're creating, you know, uh, uh, an emergency book that we hadn't had before. I mean, we've got our emergency preparedness plan, but we never had any of this in there. So, you know, adding to this and, and making sure our onboarding is updated. I mean, there's a lot of to do's that came out of this, um, this time. And I think it's going to uh, make our company stronger and it's brought all of us together in ways we've never been. Um, and more empathetic and more compassionate and, um, just it doing things different. I don't know if there is a difference. Every day is challenging. And um, on the other side of the day, we're like, thank God we got through this day and tomorrow is going to be better. <laughs> That's right. So. That's right. Um, well, I find myself saying to a lot of people with this kind of navigation without um, history and information, you might do something wrong and that's okay. Of course. You just draw on those relationships and you say, hey, 
I, I thought this was right, but today it looks a little bit different. So we're going to do this and you move on. You know, you can't really beat yourself up over things like that. Um, and lastly, um, before I turn it over to guests, um, have, I, I'm so happy, you know, historically the, our industry doesn't get phenomenally positive press. <laughs> and I'm always happy when I see positive press. And I have to say that I think we're going to come out of this time with a new place, a new standing that's seen respectfully, positively, I think all across the country, people are more than ever recognizing the industry as the very important one that it is. Um, I have seen so much positive press. I think I've only seen one that was a little disappointing and the headline was sort of inflammatory about COVID cases. And once you read the article, there were none. So, you know, it was, it was a little disappointing, but overwhelmingly positive. Have you, did you prepare for a phone call from the newspaper or TV station that said, we hear that, you know, <laughs> multiple people in your building have been diagnosed. What would you like to say about that? Have you, have you thought about that or? We think about it all the time. Um, I just, I'm a firm believer in um, honesty and however they want to take it, they're going to take it no matter how well prepared you are. They're going to spin things crazily. Um, we just keep putting out into our community all the good things that we're doing. And so we're having press releases. We've got a new grand reopening um, summer kickoff party coming. It's a parade where the sheriff and the fire chief is, and the city mayor is coming and leading our parade um, um, this Friday. And then Monday, we're having like our massive kickoff uh, summer camps. You know, it's just, there's a lot of really fun things that we're doing that we're making sure the entire community knows that we're doing this. And, um, you know, social media, tagging a company or a business or anyone that supports us in the social media, that goes, that travels a thousand miles. So I feel like the more positive you put out there and you are building those relationships and you're teaming together with everyone, these little things that may happen on the, um, the, you know, shout outs of what, how many positive cases we have or, you know, this center did this. I just feel like if we can surround that one yucky thing with all these amazing things we're doing and how incredible our teams are and what we're doing to have this amazing summer camp, I think it's going to get lost anyway. So, you know, the people that look at that and read that and give me, oh, she's got sickness in her school, you know, and cut me down are not a part of what our core values believe in anyway. So I have to really look at that and say, is this something or someone I want into my schools anyway? And if they're not supporting us and they're talking about us or they're doing things to hurt us, um, we don't want anything to be a part of them. I love that. I, I think it's Brene Brown that says if they're not also in the arena getting their butt kicked, I, although I think she uses a different word, I'm not interested in what they have to say. So that's a great quote and I, uh, I call on that one regularly. Um, I did hear another um, owner say that she is, um, every time she pr produces a communication piece for staff or parents, she thinks about if this was published, would it be okay? And that goes gr uh, greatly back to your statement about be sure that the positive communication goes along with it. We did see a outbreak in North Carolina last week where a parent sent the communication that went to them to the local newspaper. And of course they said, we don't wanna be quoted. Um, you know, so that's an a example of probably not the strongest relationship to start with. Right. But I would think about the positive approach on your communications and be sure that you're comfortable that once that goes out, it, it could be anywhere. 
Um, okay, let's jump over to some questions. Anything you want to add before we jump over? Yeah, to some I just have one more thing, Kathy, I thought of is um, something that we're putting in place right now, and it might be helpful um, for those that are trying to do everything right now and think that they can um, they can manage themselves or be the owner and director and assistant director and do everything. You know, right now, most of us are experiencing lower enrollment numbers. And um, right now, since none of us have the right answer and there's so much unknown, um, make sure that um, you're taking some time right now to maybe um, train that next person in line or give the reins to somebody else to run your, your lead your centers or direct or assistant direct, put them in a different role than the, what they're currently in. They're not gonna make your center fail right now. We'll never get low enrollment like this again. Let them step into those other shoes, build them, coach them, guide them, give them objectives. They may not do it the same way you do as an owner or a director or assistant director, but right now is the time, you guys, to get those leaders of your school, you know who your top three or four are. Make sure that you're letting them be bigger and better because it's only going to make your center better on the other side of this. And, you know, um, again, they may not do it the same as you do, but um, <laughs> do it right now. Your enrollment's low, your families are lower, give them specific job roles. Um, Tell them they should already know what your um, vision of your company is. You're just changing the strategy of how you're going to get there right now. And I, I think the more empowering you do to give these people a um, little more of a higher role uh, will help you in the long run. Right now is the time to do it. Don't stop yourself from getting these people trained. You need to call me every day and <laughs> put that in my ear. I love her ideas. Okay, you and I said last week that, you know, in the midst of trying to figure out what to do about the school, there are a million other logistical questions and decisions to be made. So some of those are here. Could you talk a little bit more? Several people have questions about the way that you're doing shoes that are worn to the school and then schools shoes at the school, do the, do the shoes that come to school go back home with the parents? Where are they stored? Are they kept in the classroom? Are they in a cubby? How are you doing that? That's interesting, Kathy. I was just talking to Abby this morning on um, how we should be doing this because we started um, when they came, their shoes went in a bag and then they would put their other shoes on that we call our inside of the school shoes. Um, they're coming so quickly that the shoes are sometimes getting piled up and is that really the best way to do it? And, you know, again, we don't have the right answer. Um, Abby and I spoke this morning about maybe having a shoe sanitize um, area where they come in, we wipe their shoes down and then they can go in. Um, we're going to firm that up at our level 10 meeting tomorrow uh, with all the directors and the management kind of throw out what's working, what isn't working. Um, we just don't want to cross contaminate and, you know, we rolled this out, I think three weeks ago and, you know, policies that you put into place so quickly, you have to kind of trial and error. And, um, I just, I really want to see how each school is, is working the shoe, um, changing and disinfecting and see if one has a stronger way of doing it that's working than the other. But I think, you need to, again, some of my schools have vestibules, some don't. Um, so what do you do if it's raining and you come in and you've got a whole bunch of shoes that are contaminated sitting right at your front door? And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a lot of things that you have to put in place and what works for each school. You know, I may have a new policy on shoes, but it's not going to work at every one of my schools in one policy. So I'm going to have to, like, change it up a little bit. So I wish I could give you the greatest answer, but, you know, I just... I suggest you try and do what works for your schools and the people that are bringing your children in. Um, but yeah, we, we've, we've uh, put the, the shoes in a bag. Um, a lot of them, we've got um, the canvas, like grocery bags. So each child has that. Okay. Um, 
Talk about uh, the million dollar question about whether people pay you or not, if you are closed. <laughs> How does that go? Yes. So um, we were doing pretty good with our tuition uh, up into uh, this, and we felt that we needed to give them uh, an option to have ops, uh, absent vouchers uh, with whatever their schedule was when we closed. So those are no paydays. And we decided that um, they could apply them to this upcoming tuition draw. We are 100% ACH. We don't take any checks. We don't do any credit cards. You are zapped of your checking account every single two weeks and you get on that schedule. We have very little challenges that way. So um, a lot of people wanted to put it on their uh, tuition coming up. Um, some wanted to save it for later for when they knew they were going on vacation because we don't usually have uh, no paydays. We took that away um, last year. And so we brought back some of these things that we've slowly taken away uh, back into our tuition um, kind of vault of creative ways to not take a huge hit all at once. Um, so it's kind of a bookkeeping nightmare a little bit, but if you got a good spreadsheet and you have a good tally system, <laughs> you make it work. You make it work. There are very, some very creative approaches to uh, charging tuition or deferring tuition. And yes. um, we did a financial strategies session two weeks ago. So that's available on our website for anyone who's interested. But basically anything you can do that puts expenses off and collects money faster in, uh, in exchange for something when you're in better shape is, is a good idea. Just, you know, to sort of think about that theory. Um, are, you, are you using staggered drop-off times? Is that a strategy that you're thinking or using? Yeah, so we've been thinking about that for the last two weeks. The, the challenge uh, piece of that is I, like that would, cure so much if the infants came at this time or the toddlers came at this time or um the problem is is almost all of our families are multi-child families so if you have a preschooler and a toddler do you have two drop-offs you know um do you have it based on your last name from a to f and you know f to m and like we don't know what would be the best answer for that we've definitely thrown around a lot of different options so it's not so crazy at um, you know the six to nine o'clock uh, time zone but um, right now we have not gone to that we're um, making it work it's it's challenging um, especially my one location it's a very it's 15,000 square feet and it is long mm -hmm. and um, to get back up in front and get the next round of people and not have them wait for so long it's 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 hard in washing the children's hands. It's, it's not an easy thing. We've spoke about staffing um, and having um, a runner, uh, making sure that we have a runner. But again, then, you know, it's, it's all about not exposing yourself to so many children. And do we have an infant runner, a toddler runner, a preschool runner? You know, there's a lot that is constantly going on in your head to make sure that everyone is safe. A lot of juggling. Um, talk a little bit more about masks. I, I believe that you said that your teachers were not initially wearing masks and that you have gone to wearing masks. And how is that going? And are Correct. we right about that? Yeah, so just um, pointing out how quickly things change. On Sunday, uh, when I had my all team meeting, you know, I said, please, if you guys want to wear masks, I highly recommend, you know, that you do. If you know, it's okay, we support everything. You do what you feel is safe for you. Well, heck, by Wednesday, it was, I was mandating and the policy was changing and everybody had to, to wear masks because it was coming so quickly at my one location. I thought if, if we could get masks on all the adults in the other locations, that may stop the, the spread and we just couldn't get ahead of it at the one location. So maybe we could cut it off a little bit more by getting these um, staff into masks. Uh, so we rolled that out. We talked to all the families. Uh, we talked to all the staff. I did 
did a Facebook Live, making sure that everybody knew that we were closing the one school. This is why. This is how many cases we had. I am now making sure that you guys think smart about what you do for Memorial Weekend. It's a three-day weekend. Everybody wants to travel. Everybody wants to have barbecues. I support that, but just be smart. Um, they didn't feel comfortable, a lot of them in the mask. They were hot. They were sweaty. They didn't, you know, it's something new. It's a change. It's, I get it. I, I don't like wearing it to the grocery store, but I do. Um, but you know, for the safety and security, I, I needed them to understand the importance of wearing them. And it's not because I'm being mean and it's not because, oh, it's, we're just doing this because the state says so. Um, we're doing this because we are living proof at one of our locations that we need to slow this down and, and get ahead of it. Um, you know, we had a couple families that really didn't like that fact and they thought that maybe they would pull out um, and come again in the fall when there were no masks. But when I let them know that we were probably going to still be in masks in the fall, they um, were upset. And, you know, but that's only two, two moms out of all, you know, 500 children that I usually have. So, so if you have that communication effectively and clearly and always state the why we do this because of this, or because of this, we're doing this, um, they, they'll understand. You'll always have a, a few families that, or staff that will not like your decisions, but the more you can communicate the benefit of it, um, the less fear that they'll have or anger. Or, you know, change is hard. I mean, change is hard for everyone. And, and having to wear this, um, you know, make it fun for the children, make, make them understand why you're wearing it, you know, read them books about it, you know, show them more videos of you, you know, in your mask so they get it, you know, they, they start to understand that this could potentially be the new normal. We don't know. We hope not, but we don't know. So there was a question about what parents' reactions were when you first called to let them know that there were active cases in your building. So I'm finding it, in, I'm gonna want you to answer that, but it's interesting that it sounds like you had more um, upset over teachers wearing masks than you did the fact that there was a situation in the building, but tell yeah. us how that went and what reactions you got. So overall, I would say um, our families were grateful that of the communication. Um, the Abby and the two assistant directors that were running the school kind of divide and conquer the phone calls. And um, Abby took the moms that she knew the best and maybe the ones that might take it a little bit differently than, than the others. Um, we did have one uh, mom that was, was really upset. However, uh, that mom has been great ever since. And she even <laughs> made the comment, um, heck, if it's going to be this easy to have it with just a 99 degree fever, this, and it goes away so quick, I could see this being like chicken pox parties and we could just get everybody together. And I'm like, no, 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 let's not do that. Um, but she was uh, very supportive after, you know, um, I think, again, Abby communicates very effectively and very thoroughly and um, my managers do as well. Uh, very supportive. I it, I was amazed at how well that went over. Um, and then as we got more positive cases, um, we were letting people know to please just let us know when you were positive um, or if you were showing any symptoms or signs. Um, our last one was just this weekend um, of one of our teachers in the infant rooms. And uh, Abby had put out a letter to the infant families and I believe she only got one phone call from that letter of you know because we've been communicating daily you know this is how many cases we have this is how many this is what they're presenting with this is you know the symptoms um, for teachers and educators but I truly think that they are trusting us to make the best decision to make their school safe and when we closed completely um, for the week, they were very, very understanding, very understanding. There's the question about initially the uh, incident was in one classroom, obviously, and you made a decision there before it spread to other classrooms. When you had it in the first, in just one classroom, did you communicate that to just that classroom's parents or everything? 
We physically called the families of the classroom uh, and then told them that they had to quarantine as well as their siblings and the parents for two weeks. That was what was recommended by our health department. And then um, a letter went out to all the rest of the families. Okay. Um, someone's asking the question is, have all who have tested positive recovered? Well, there are a lot of people who are still active. So everyone's doing fine. But yeah, we have, yeah, we have one that's still sick, and that was our first one. Um, she has asthma, so it's it's um, a little bit different with her. But all of the other ones are, you know, very, very tired, uh, a very bad headache. You know, um, I think sleep, sleeping a lot, and the fever goes up and then goes away and then goes up and goes away. One day they feel just okay, and they feel like a human being, and then the next day, um, they're down again, but um, nothing very, very serious um, that I would say I would I would worry. It's acting and presenting like influenza, um, a little bit stronger than that. But um, yeah, things are people are good, doing okay. A couple of people are asking you to repeat your protocol of the lower temperature. What is the temperature? How do you manage? Sure. It? What What are you doing? Yep, so uh, the regular protocol is 100.4, I believe. We just said 100 um, degrees uh, axillary. And so we lowered that to 99 degrees. And we made sure all the families understood that when this was coming out, you know, these are what we're checking for. 99 degree fever, your child will be asked to leave the center. Or if they have a 99 degree fever, when we check it upon, uh, coming into the building, you, we, they cannot come into the building. And then um, on a regular non-COVID, it's 24 hours fever-free, medicine-free policy. Uh, now we have increased that to 72 hours. They have to be 72 hours fever-free, medicine-free before coming back. Okay, thanks. Um, there's, um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of and getting a lot of questions about liability. So someone's asking if you did a liability waiver. And if you don't mind, I'd just like to start with, um, there are a lot of questions right now and you don't walk out of your door every morning without the threat of liability. You know, it, it's true of every single person and every single business owner. So, um, it's making us think a little bit more about it now. We're getting a lot of people asking us if they're liability waivers. Uh, we don't necessarily think you can waive liability. You can just operate the best way you can and then you deal with what happens. Um, how, how are you thinking about that or are you thinking? About it? No, um, for me, it's, it's not about the liability per se, it's more about making sure the communication is thorough, um, doing everything we can to protect them, um, keep them safe. And at the end of the day, I wanna walk away knowing I have done everything in my power to do what's right for my centers as a whole. That means my staff, my management team, my families, the children, I mean, the children inside the building, but then everybody on the outside. And so whatever that looks like to keep everyone safe, non-COVID even, you know, is, is my goal as, a, uh, as an owner. And people will not like your decisions. People will be upset with you for, for bringing your temperatures down to 99 degree when you do that. You're going to communicate your why all the time, like I said before. And now our families are thanking us for being so proactive. Um, I've gotten more letters right now thanking me for all of our communication. Um, parents that said, you know, they have friends at other childcare centers and they're not receiving what we're doing. They're not having fun and games outside. They're not doing all this. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm present and I wanna be there. Um, liability, we've got a business that is huge we're liable for a lot of things and if at the top of your mind safety and security every day COVID or not is not like up front and center 
you got to think a little bit more outside the box and, and get going on some new policies and procedures to make sure you do have everything in place. And we, we don't know everything. We never will, COVID or not. Uh, we just got to do what we think is right and what we think is going to operate our centers um, the best. Thank you. Um, I know I'm, I'm keeping you way past. Um. <laughs> I'm good. If you're good, I'm good. And we will not get to everyone's questions, but you guys know that we will answer your questions. So we will back, we will, whichever ones we don't address, we will work to get you answers to your questions. Um, I want to end with a couple of um, questions about staff because I think this is where you really shine, like I say, and also um, how you have been able to navigate this um, in such a positive way. Um, one, one question is, did you have any staff that were um, either immune compromised or in an age group that needed to um, be more protective and how did you handle that? Yeah, so um, we have a handful of staff that um, were um, that had a little bit different immunity um, for whatever reason, multiple reasons, and um, they uh, some of them are still out. Uh, some of them chose on their own will to come back. Um, we always have given it an option. Um, they are in charge of their schedules. Uh, telling us at this point in time, not always, but right now during COVID, you know, what works best. We asked for a doctor's note. Um, we communicate with them weekly to make sure, you know, um, I heard on one of the webinars, you know, check up from the neck up and like that from, from that point on, we are, I mean, we've always been in communication, but we're really making sure that we're communicating. And I have one person that is um, communicating on top of what the directors are communicating with those employees. So um, the last one just goes beautifully in the staff. So it's a scary time for everyone. How do you, and you know, so many providers are struggling right now with staff who are making more money possibly because they're furloughed and and maybe they're fearful or maybe they just don't, you know, they prefer to stay home and make more money. How have you kept your staff morale high? How have you kept them engaged? How have you kept them showing up and being excited about the company? And then of course, um, you know, there was an actual issue and you're still keeping their morale high. So talk to us about some of your strategies there. So we, um, we have a director of core values on our team. Uh, she is strictly in charge of making sure that um, our team morale and our family's morale are high at all times. So um, we, again, meet weekly, uh, one for our level 10 meetings and one for our marketing meetings during this time. And we just talk about everything we're gonna do for our staff in the upcoming week. Um, we're having popsicles uh, providing to them. They have to come out and get them. We're doing body scrubs. They come out and they create their body scrubs. We are uh, going to the staff that are no longer on site and we're coloring their driveways. We're putting yard signs up. We are giving them um, gift baskets. We were very close with our community. So we've got a lot of gift cards, a lot of people that are bringing things to us. Um, so in turn, we are we are giving it back to our uh, employees. We, um, if they have a birthday or they have an anniversary, the children are singing to them and we send uh, the Zoom link and they are live at home so we can uh, make sure that they're getting the communication um, from the classroom. Um, we have done so many, <laughs> Just trying to think of everything we've done every week we we have something that we do shout outs on facebook or any social media or instagram we do um shout out from the families the families are are recording things and thanking the staff we um we had one um we have a hashtag cot strong and we had one mom make shirts for our whole entire center at one location um we have uh 
yeah, we just, and then I've got trivia nights going on where the staff get on and we've had bingo. Um, we've had, we just, we keep going with all thinking outside of the box and it's fun and we have to laugh and we, this is a time where it's stressful and it's crazy. And we want those employees to take ownership of our companies because if they don't have a company they want to come to or work in um, and they think that they need to make more money on an unemployment, we got to make sure that we have a little bit of a mind shift with them and get them to think that these families miss them. Your team misses you. We need you back. So we have a company for you to come back to when your unemployment does run out. It's not going to be forever. And um, out of all of my employees, I had one employee tell me that she, this isn't going to be for her right now. And she just needs to, um, she needs to rethink about her position at our company. And we just turned and said to her, we will consider that your resignation. And she was like, what? And we talked her through it and she resigned. And, and that's okay. I, I totally understand that. We don't want that to affect everyone else's headspace right now. We need to have a clear headspace and a fun environment for the, the stressful situation on site. So we just, you know, my my term is speed of the leader, speed of the team. So I'm up like whoop, whoop, all the time getting on the Zoom calls. We've got meetings. All right, what's going good? You know, and and you just have to be powerful and you have to be excited and you have to be goofy and you have to wear silly hats or sunglasses or silly outfits on these Zoom calls. You just have to do it because they need you right now. They need to relax. They need to have fun. Um, and they need to have your centers to come back to because they're relying on us. So um, everything we can do to, to keep our teams coming. Um, all of my subs still want to come back, but they don't have any centers to go to right now. Um, but we contact them every week. We send them birthday cards. We're writing them goofy notes all the time. It's, it's just about really thinking outside the box and, and, getting on a level with them that you never have. This, this, these are times that you've got to think differently. And you guys, fun. Have fun. Don't, don't let the stress take you down. And if it is taking you down, appoint it to somebody else to be that person. Um, I have fun and I still have a director of core values. You know, I mean, we just, she is out there planning everything every week, ready to roll no matter what. I love it. And I think that's a fantastic way to end. And again, we will get back with others who have questions. Uh, Alita, if you will share with me before next week, I'm sure I'll be bugging you how, how you're doing and how your school's doing and how your reopen goes on Monday. We all wish you uh, the best Thank you. with that situation and with your grand reopening. I think that's a fantastic idea. And we um, will just look forward to hearing from you again. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Good luck, Thank everyone. Let me know if you need anything. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, friend. And we hope to see you back next week. And let us know if we can support. All right. Take care, Thank everyone. You. Have a good day. Be well.